Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I think we've got a few. I don't know if we've uh, resolved the technical difficulties here. Can you hear me okay? No. But the mic's not working. Then we'll slide it forward. Okay. I know we don't need a mic. I don't know about everybody else. We're kind of close here. I think we need it. But uh, we'll go ahead and proceed. Like I said, I want to welcome everybody here and call to order our Suffolk City Council School Board joint meeting. Um, I'm going to start with just the introduction of our council members, and we'll follow that up with Chairman Riddick introducing uh, his board members, and from there I'll turn it over to the manager to uh, go over our discussion items for this afternoon. So to my left, the Vice Mayor Ward, we have Council Member Bennett, Council Member Johnson, everybody's got a name tag, I won't mess it up today, Council Member Williams, Council Member Fawcett, Council Member Rector, and uh, Council Member Butler Barlow uh, will not be with us this afternoon, uh, nor at our council meeting, is, and has been excused. Uh, Chairman Riddick, would you like to introduce your board members? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off by letting you all know that School Board Member Barham will not be with us this afternoon as well. But starting to my immediate left, we have uh, Dr. Brooks Buck, School Board Member representing the uh, Nasman Barrow. Then we have School Board Member Jenkins representing the Cypress Barrow. Then we have School Board Member uh, Brittingham representing Holy Neck. School Board Member Slinglove representing the Chuckatuck Barrow. And we also have Vice Chair Howe representing Sleepy Hole. Okay, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our city manager now and give us a brief overview of our discussion items for this afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, of course, this afternoon, both city staff and the school staff will be presenting um, various elements that are listed on your agenda. It will start off with the initial presentation will be the proposed FY25 to uh, 2034 capital improvement plan as it relates to the school programs. I believe uh, Wednesday, Wendy or in, um, Charles Meek will do that presentation together. Uh, not sure. If Excuse me, Harry. Uh, City Manager, Dr. Book, do I have a book? Uh, Mr. Board, it's going to be um, Ms. Forsman, our Chief Financial Officer, who will be assisted by our Director of Facilities, Planning, and Maintenance, Mr. Terry Napier, is going to present the SBS School Board 2025-2034 Capital Improvement Plan. Uh, just to point out to our board members and city council members, this is, will be uh, different than what you see later on in the slide deck as compared to what the city uh, moved forward when it comes to what we submitted versus what the city will be allowed to do. So I'll, I'll call to the podium Ms. Forsman and um, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just checking to see who was presenting yes. for you all. But then I'll be followed with Charles Meeks, uh, our Interim Director of Budget. And then from there, we'll have two other presentations related to projected enrollment trends, student generation, school ca uh, capacities, and that'll be uh, Dr. Bird, uh, Terry Napier, Jeff Harris, Mark Post, and Deputy City Manager Kevin Hughes will do those presentations. And um, Deputy City Manager Hughes will also do the disposition of school property, the process in which is necessary. And I'm sorry, the superintendent. But yeah, I'm ready for you. Man. All right. If I could just interject one other thing as far as uh, procedures concerned, trying to come up with a way to make the best use of our time and allow everybody an appropriate amount of time to talk. It is proposed that we'll do both the CIP presentations, the student generation and school capacity projection, and then after that we will ask for comments and questions of both council and the school board, and we'll just go around the room and we'll allocate five minutes max for that first go around. I mean, it's uh, 15, 14, so it's 70 minutes. It's an hour and 10 minutes if everybody takes up to five minutes, and then we'll go back around. Uh, so with that being said, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, if you can go ahead. All right, thank you, Mayor Duman. Uh, can I call to the podium our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Wendy Forsman, who will be assisted by Mr. Terry Napier, our Director of Facilities, Planning and Maintenance, to review the SBS 2025-2034 Capital Improvement Plan. Good afternoon. Uh, as Dr. Gordon said, we are going to present to you the school's submission to the city. The school submission of the city is on. There you go. Okay, there it goes. Good afternoon again. Sorry. As uh, Dr. Gordon has stated, we're going to um, 
present to you all the school's submission to the city for the CIP. Once it goes to the city, then they make their decisions, and that will be what you see second. Slightly different from what we do, but they have to put it together with the rest of their, their plan. Remember, please, that this is a one-year plan for 10 years. Every year we resubmit. Every year we make new decisions. So it's a one-year for 10 years. So Mr. Napier is going to go over the first five years and what the school board approved and sent to the city as part of our submission. Mr. Napier. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to run through this fairly rapidly as this is not new information for either the school board or the city council. Uh, but as you see on the slide, uh, the school board submitted projects uh, beginning at the top on the left-hand column, major systems repair replacements. Uh, what is notable about that line in the first three years, you will notice there are no funds there. Uh, those were transferred to the Northern Shores Elementary School Addition Project uh, in years four and five. The board has requested $7 million in each of those years for a $14 million total uh, in year five. Uh, moving down the list, John F. Kennedy Middle School replacement, which is underway, by the way, uh, and we're very pleased with that. Uh, this 24-25, that's $25 million uh, that has been entered into that line. That is not to suggest that that building cost $25 million. There was some previous funding. Uh, the cost was actually 72 and some change. Moving down, the Northern Shores Elementary Addition, uh, 3.5 million in 24-25, 11.3 million in 25-26, uh, for 14.8 million on that line item. Uh, the College and Career Academy at Prudent Reno uh, Renovation, 2.6 million. Uh, the total five-year on that, 2.6 million. Elephants Fork Elementary School replacement. 800 student replacement, 26.2 uh, and 2627, 26.2 again and 2728 for a total of 52.4 million. Kilby Shores Elementary School replacement, also 800 students, 5.5 uh, million and 2728, 23.9 million and 2829, 29.5 million uh, over the course of that five years. Forest Glen Middle School replacement, also 800 students. 5.6 million in 2829, uh, which brings that to a total of 5.6 million in the first five years. Uh, you can see the projected cost in years six through 10, 60.1 million, uh, and then the 10 year total at 65.8. Nanzaman Parkway Elementary replacement, also 800 students. Uh, that is not in the first five years, uh, but the projected total on that was 56.6 million. Uh, the same with the Nanzam River High School addition, not in the first five years, but as you move out, uh, projected at 35 million at year 10. And then the John Yates Middle School replacement, which would be 1,000 students, also not in the first five years, projected at 75.9 million uh, after the 10 year total. And then the operations facility phase two, also not in the first five years, uh, 19.8 million. Uh, in the second half of this 10-year plan. So those are the board's submitted priority projects uh, for this CIP cycle. Okay, uh, board uh, members of council, uh, we'll call Charles Meeks to the mic this time. We've been going through the process, as you're aware, of uh, uh, developing the CIP for consideration uh, by the Planning Commission and ultimately by City Council. Charles will go through our process and then what we had to do as we uh, blended in um, some of our quality of life and public safety elements into the budget. Charles. Good afternoon. Uh, before uh, going into an overview of the CIP process, as Ms. Forsman uh, noted, uh, it's important to note that uh, the CIP is a plan. It's not a budget. Uh, it's developed uh, over a 10-year horizon with an emphasis on the first five years, and it's updated annually. Some projects move forward, some of them get pushed back um, or eliminated, uh, and then other new projects uh, get proposed, and depending on funding opportunities, uh, may be put forward in the plan. Uh, funding for the projects in the adopted CIP do not get approved uh, until an appropriation is made by City Council in the annual budget process, and this funding, as Ms. Forsman noted, covers the first year. 
Uh, this first slide uh, is provided to give you some background regarding the CIP process, where we've been, where we're at now, and where we're going. Uh, we begin in late summer, uh, sending out uh, CIP request packages to the departments and Suffolk Public Schools. Uh, those requests are due back in September. Uh, they're reviewed uh, and compiled by the budget staff. Uh, and then in October, uh, the city manager holds meetings with the submitting departments, Suffolk Public Schools uh, staff, superintendent. And at that point, uh, we also are in uh, discussions with our financial advisors for the city uh, to determine what our affordability is. Uh, in terms of uh, bond funding, general fund cash, looking at our economic uh, situation locally, our revenues, uh, reserve balances, and outstanding debt and debt service. Um, as you can imagine, the project requests always exceed uh, the available funding, and this year was, was no different. Uh, we had to push out over $200 million out of the first five years. Uh, into year six through 10. Uh, with this information in hand, uh, we then finalize the city manager's proposed CIP in late October, and then move it forward to the CIP subcommittee in November. Uh, the CIP subcommittee consists of the mayor, the vice mayor, and two members of the planning commission. Uh, we take their feedback, make any adjustments that are necessary, and then move the plan forward uh, to the planning commission in December. Uh, after uh, presenting to the Planning Commission in December, uh, we come back to the Planning Commission in January, uh, take any recommendations, and then ask for their adoption. At that point, the plan moves forward to City Council, uh, where it's presented at the first meeting in February. At the second meeting, uh, we hold a public hearing, take uh, any council uh, adjustments or edits uh, into the plan, and then uh, the CIP is adopted by council. And then again, the first year of that uh, adopted CIP is then put forward in the city manager's proposed budget, uh, which gets rolled out in April. Looking at the um, where we've landed uh, with the proposed CIP, uh, you will see here uh, the five-year plan uh, totals $383 million. That's across all funds, uh, including public utilities, fleet, stormwater, transit, and general government projects. Uh, school projects fall within the general government uh, category, uh, which totals $283.6 million. You will see uh, at the bottom of this slide here uh, the proposed funding sources for those general government projects. Uh, you'll notice a little bit of a difference this year. Uh, our proposed bonds uh, were showing at approximately $35 million uh, each year. Uh, I'm working with our financial advisors and taking a look at the trajectory of the city's uh, growth and economy. Uh, we feel confident that we can increase our bond funding capacity from what's been $30 million for a number of years up to around 35. Uh, state, federal, and other funding, uh, we're showing at 51.6 over those five years. Uh, this is uh, grant funding uh, primarily for transportation, parks and recreation, and some airport projects. And then the transfer from general fund at $60.9 million. This is uh, general fund cash, uh, and it consists of about $38 million in recurring general fund money that we have to build into the operating budget to meet our uh, financial policy for uh, PAYGO. So 3% of the general fund expenditures, less certain transfers, we have to build that into the budget each year so we don't debt finance the entire CIP. Uh, that works out to about six and a half to eight million dollars per year. Uh, as the budget increases, the amount of cash that we have to build into the budget has to increase as well to meet that three percent threshold. We're also proposing uh, in the CIP over the first five years the use of $22.9 million 
in capital reserve funds. Now, the capital reserve funds are also general fund cash. These funds are uh, general fund dollars that fall to the fund balance uh, at, the, at year end, so it's excess uh, money uh, that we end the year with. We're able to use some of that. It falls to the uh, fund balance and put into the capital reserve fund. Looking at the uh, five-year general government uh, expenditures, just focusing on local funding, uh, which would be the bonds, the general fund cash, and the capital reserve funds, uh, you will see what's proposed in the plan is we're directing $88.2 million, uh, or 38% of those local funds, for school projects, 18% for transportation, 17% for public safety, 13% for public buildings, 8% for parks and recreation projects, and 6% for village, downtown, and neighborhood projects. Looking at the uh, general government revenues, uh, which would include the bonds, general fund capital reserve, and state and federal other uh, funds, 60% of the general government projects are going to be financed through bonds, 22% uh, with general fund and capital reserve cash, and 18% with state and federal uh, grants that we either know we're getting, uh, we, we either have approved uh, award agreements in hand, or we have a reasonable expectation uh, that we're going to receive those over the next five years. So where have we landed in terms of uh, school projects in the proposed CIP? Uh, right now, uh, $88.2 million over the first five years. Uh, schools, major repairs and systems replacement beginning in FY28 and 29 at $5 million uh, each year. What's not shown here is the out years uh, due to the size of the, of the slide. Uh, but when the CIP is rolled out, you'll see that we've ramped that up to between seven and nine million dollars a year moving forward, uh, beginning in FY30. Uh, the JFK middle school replacement, we're showing 25 million dollars in year one uh, to round out uh, the 75 million dollars that's needed uh, to complete that project. The 50 million dollars in previous funding includes the school construction grant that was received from the Virginia Department of Education, as well as previous bond funding and some funds transferred from another project. The Northern Shores Elementary Addition, uh, we have in here at almost 3.6 million in FY25, 11.3 in FY26, and the previous $1.2 million that was approved in the current fiscal year. Uh, what's not shown uh, there is the recent grant application or grant funding uh, that was submitted to the state. Um, so if, if that comes uh, to fruition, we'll need to accept and appropriate those dollars. The College and Career Academy at Pruden, uh, we're showing in year three at $2.6 million. Elephant's Fork Elementary School replacement uh, beginning in FY28 at $9.5 million, 26.2 in FY29, and then the balance of that uh, project funding is $18.7 million uh, will be in FY30 in the proposed plan. I will note that we increased the uh, funding by $2 million from what was requested um, in, in the school's request, and that is for land acquisition. We believe there will be some land acquisition that will be needed for this project. So we've added $2 million uh, to the fiscal year 28 uh, amount. Kilby Shores Elementary School replacement, Forest Glen, Nansman Parkway, Nansman River, John Yates, and the operations facility uh, all of these projects you will see when the CIP comes out in the next couple of weeks are shown in the out years uh, at the funding levels uh, requested by Suffolk Public Schools. 
the next steps in the uh, CIP process uh, will be going to Planning Commission here in a couple weeks on December 19th, presenting the plan to the full Planning Commission. We'll come back to them in January and ask for uh, any recommendations and adoption of the CIP. Then we move forward to Council in February uh, and with our public hearing and then uh, adoption uh, at that second meeting. Uh, with that, we'll try to answer any questions and then turn it over to Kevin Hughes. I think uh, if we can hold the discussion, both we'll do the generation with the CIP, and then I think you blend that together and have a good discussion. And with that, uh, Dr. Gordon, I believe you have uh, your staff coming forward. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moore. I'm going to call to the podium Dr. Stanette Bird, our Chief of Schools, Mr. Terry Napier, Director of Facilities and Planning. Both of these gentlemen will be assisted by Jeff Harris, Principal at RRMM Architects, and Mr. Mark Prost, also Principal at RRMM Architects. Uh, we wanted to be able to provide both to the school board and to council uh, part of an overview of our original facility study that was done, uh, but more importantly to also show the actual functional or program use to how our schools are being used. This will differ from what you see for the actual enrollment of a building is different than how the building is actually being used. Uh, Dr. Bird and Mr. Napier and our RMM team will also uh, do a quick review of projected enrollment as well as showing how some of the numbers that we have received have been adjusted some due to proffers as well as boosts that we've seen in enrollment uh, since COVID-19 has ended. Uh, so with that being said, Dr. Bird, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Uh, greetings, members of City Council and members of the school board. Uh, my name is Stinnett Bird and I serve as your Chief of Schools. Today we'll be sharing with you on projected enrollment trends. I do notice that you all are looking in, in your books, so I'm going to um, attempt to move through the presentation and at the same time allow you to see what page you're on. A lot of pages you'll see are duplicated. It's really one slide, but you see multiple slides for the um, um, purpose of me having you focus on certain columns at one time. Okay. All right, so as Dr. Gordon shared, I will um, share with you historical data, and I will add on each school's current enrollment and then functional capacity. Next, Mr. Napier will come in to introduce members of um, our RMM, and they'll share with you the facility condition index, and then Mr. Napier will give you our recommendations at the end. All right, so once again, on the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through um, the enrollment from back in 1920. I'll show you how that compares to a, um, a um, five-year projection. I'll talk about current enrollment. We'll build on functional capacity and layer, and, excuse me, functional capacity, and I'll talk about how that is calculated. Um, as Then we'll conclude with facility condition index. And at any point, if you have any questions, I can explain uh, our rationale or any calculations. Okay. So the first page in your book um, that you get to looks like this. And keep in mind, it's all just one slide that's being um, broken apart in different sections. This was our enrollment back in 1920, excuse me, 2019 and 2022 school year. And that's the first column you see. If you turn to the next page, you will see what the five-year projection was back at that time. And notice this projection is for the year 24-25, which is next year. So if you look at those two columns, you can see that there are some uh, differences. But this was a, a best guess at the time, uh, not a guess, I should say. But this was um, using information and data from 19 2019-2020 to make this um, prediction. All right, as you flip to the next page, I've layered on top of that current enrollments. I think everyone is following with me. And if you look at the current enrollment page, you'll see that there are some differences in projections versus where we are now, specifically with <coughs> Elephant's Fork, Matt Ben, and Northern Shores Elementary School. Um, the projections at that time using the information that was available had those schools um, enrollment declining when in actuality they are growing as you can see here. All right, so I just want to take a minute to point that out. The next slide you're going to see is basically going to remove that five-year projection slide. 
And we're just going to focus on where we were in 2019 and where we are now. All right, so I've just eliminated that projection slide. If you turn to the next page, now I have layered on the functional capacity. And this is how we calculate how many students we can um, serve in a school setting. This is very different from the, the building capacity in that we would not include things like the um, cafeteria, the auditorium, many of our um, exploratory classes because um, those are designed for students to flow through. Um, also, I'd like to note at this point, since we're here, you may have noticed parentheses next to some of the school names. Those are the number of mobile trailers that we have. So those are also not included in functional capacity. So when you look at the functional capacity of our buildings, which is excluding the gymnasium, the auditorium, art rooms, and so on, when you look at that compared to uh, the current enrollment, you'll notice that I highlighted Nansen River High School as an area that is over what we consider our functional capacity. And then to round out this chart, if you turn the page, this will add on the um, this will add on the. Uh, Facility Condition Index. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Napier at this time. And although you see many other charts, keep in mind it's just one, and this is the last one that we need to look at for this presentation. Facility Condition Index, or FCI. Uh, just a quick refresher, when we did the facility study, each school that was included in that study was assigned a Facility Condition Index, or FCI. Uh, we happen to have an expert in this, uh, Mark Probst with RRMM. He was uh, very involved with calculating those, and he is going to come up and explain to you what an FCI is and how they calculate that. Thank you, Terry. Good afternoon. So the far right column, as Terry indicated, is the calculated FCI scores or facility condition index scores for each of the schools assessed. Um, and an FCI score is calculated by taking the total deferred maintenance costs. Um, and for this particular assessment, we broke down a set, uh, deferred maintenance costs over time periods. So the first three years were high priority items. So any deferred, uh, deferred maintenance items that fell in that first three year period um, were high priority. We took deferred maintenance items that were calculated as high priority items and then divided uh, the total deferred maintenance items uh, by the cost, construction cost, to replace the, the, each particular school. Um, and that's based on an average cost uh, per square foot for construction, um, based on the existing square footage of the building. Uh, no increase, no decrease in the existing school square footage, um, but the costs per square foot represent rebuilding it to today's modern standards. Uh, I think it's also important to note that there, there sometimes there's discrepancies, a couple of percentage points um, between schools. Um, that's typically based on square footages more than it is on the system components or the building systems that are in need of repair. Also, as Mr. Napier is coming back up, just as a reminder to City Council and the Board, you see zeros beside Colonel Fred Cherry, Florence Bowser, and Southwestern as those schools were new enough that the, uh, the architects and the school system decided there was no need to review those at that time. So recommendations, and the first one's kind of a no-brainer. Continue replacing AD schools and or schools currently utilizing mobile units through the CIP process. Um, I would like to say that I think, given my time uh, since Creekside opened, I think both the school board and the city council, uh, we have done a lot in terms of getting new buildings uh, on our inventory. So I congratulate you on that. Uh, we would certainly like to accelerate the pace uh, when the opportunity, or if the opportunity, and I'm sure you would too, arises uh, so that we can get some of these older buildings off of our inventory as well. But I do think that it's important to note 
uh, that with uh, John F. Kennedy uh, being underway, uh, that's the sixth school in my tenure at facilities, so that's one every three and a half years or so. Uh, so I think that's very good, um, but let's keep working to, to accelerate that a little bit whenever we can. Uh, second recommendation, utilize school building functional programmatic capacity, which we just talked about, uh, based on available instructional space and specific use of those spaces for our future planning and development. I think it's important that both the city and my staff and Dr. Gordon's staff, all of us, I think we, it's important that we operate off the same set of numbers. Uh, we come up with a programmatic capacity, which you just saw, that is not going to match the VDOE capacity at the time of construction. They do it a completely different way. Uh, but what that programmatic capacity says to us is, based on how we're using a school at any given point in time, this is the number of children that we can put in it. So I, I think it would be best for future planning uh, if we could consider using those numbers uh, rather than something different such as a VDOE number. Uh, third, in looking at the UDO, and you're all familiar with that, uh, consider changing the city UDO level of service standard for schools from building total square footage uh, to, to uh, instructional square footage per student. Uh, I think currently the, the, the level, the standard that we're shooting for in elementary, it's 135 square feet per student. Uh, middle school is 160, high school is 163. The problem with that number, as we alluded to earlier, that includes everything in the building, mechanical spaces, hallways, everything that's not an instructional space. Uh, and given the way that teaching and learning take place now, I think it would be beneficial for all of us, and certainly our students and teachers, if we were to change that level or that standard uh, to consider instructional square footage per student rather than total building square footage per student. There's a lot of things that we do in, in instruction now that we didn't do even 5, 10, or 15 years ago, or when I taught, you know, 100 years ago. Um, things are different. They do, they do STEM activities, they do all kinds of collaborative things in these classrooms, and even the recommended VDOE number for classroom size, I think, is too small. So I think it would be worth talking about with our instructional folks what would be a good square footage number for instructional spaces and make that our level of service rather than the total square footage on the building. All right, Mr. Moore, that concludes the projected enrollment and functional capacity presentation. Okay, at this time, Kevin Hughes, Deputy City Manager, will uh, come to the podium to, to talk a little bit more as we looked at the um, cooperative strategy study from previously. Kevin? Thank you, Mr. Manager. Good afternoon, all. So um, when we started and rolled out the uh, what I'll call the school studies that, you know, we, we talk about uh, – fairly regularly there just as a reminder oftentimes it, it makes sense to kind of go back and revisit and make sure it kind of marinated in and we're all um, <clears throat> on the same page about how we're moving forward um, so wanted to kind of revisit the numbers that were presented at the time how it's <coughs> trending and what that means um, for us all especially for us uh, at the city side um, I'll remind you that there are essentially four different studies that were done uh, we're all familiar with the facility study that was done uh, by RRMM, but there are also the projections for student uh, growth. There was also the kind of a census uh, where the students were, where they live, and then additionally uh, a tool that we used uh, to assist us in creating some consistency uh, related to proffers and the calculations that are connected to them. And uh, we're happy to uh, continue to explore what the best numbers are. I would tell you that one of the reasons that we wanted to have some of these studies in place when we did this study related to the proffers was it wasn't always consistent when we dealt and worked with the development community when we were gauging costs related to CIP projects to where uh, we might have a calculation, schools might submit a calculation. We wanted to kind of create some consistency and so through that we ended up using some averages that the state was reporting by different school systems throughout the area with a weighted average for Hampton Roads and so 
our uh, real driver related to the school cost was a tool and an exercise to create consistency to the development community. So they kind of knew year over year what to expect, what that expense would be. So before I uh, go and uh, beat that up too hard, um, one of the things also that comes up frequently to us at the, the school system, especially maybe when a contentious rezoning is coming in for a, re, uh, um, a rezoning is uh, all those new homes and the, the impact that will happen at the school system. And it's, it's kind of easy to get caught up in that uh, or a new neighborhood or apartment complex and what is that going to do to us. And so uh, I, I frequently uh, return back to this cooperative strategies uh, study uh, to, to kind of uh, use that as a guide. And so, again, this was a, a good tool. We'll show you that it's kind of tracking well. Um, but, again, they took into account live burst, enrollment, census data, and building permits because that is relevant. However, context does make sense. Um, and, again, this study was done to roll out to 2930. Uh, and so, again, just as a, as a reminder, some of those um, – data points that are reflected in here uh, and questions to be asked to create projections include new homes, the births, uh, housing experiencing uh, related to turnovers. So I would gather to, to estimate that the year, this year and maybe part of last year with interest rate risings and not as many homes going on the market, you'll see a flattening would be my guess, so time will tell. Um, uh, attendance in private and home schools, and we've seen a, a, a jump there a little bit. Um, unemployment, uh, things of that nature. Uh, educational policies, um, you know, the world's gotten complex, as you well know. Uh, so one of the, the, the deliveries of this, because it's hard to put your finger on where, uh, where the projections will be, was the consultant came out with four potential outcomes. And you can see there on the line chart kind of a low if we're continuing to decline. And again, on the left-hand side, the, that bright red, that was uh, how the school's been growing or, or <coughs> flattening from uh, 2010 to 2018, 2019. Then there was a moderate growth kind of in the, the greenish color. Uh, what they ended up recommending to us at the time and that little uh, grayer. And then a, a, a high end that's kind of heading up uh, northward trajectory. So, again, the consultant said, we think you should uh, look at this recommended number that kind of dropped it between moderate and high. And what's interesting, if you go back and explore this, and for me, I've had to look at this many times just because I don't live in this world, uh, and looking at um, how they come up with these projections, you can see the coloring and the scale. And some of those are, are done on purpose to denote kind of some changes that happen at different grade periods. And it's interesting to see, and it's not unique to Suffolk by any means, where you can uh, see where the, the children are entering at different school levels. Uh, you see a kind of a, 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 a slight drop, and then it kind of stays consistent in the thousands. And then a, a big jump increase around freshman year, and then a, a decline as you get into to senior year. And again, that's not necessarily unique to Suffolk. But those are kind of the factors that go in place. And those things are occurring while housing is, is being added uh, to, to the school as well. And so again, following the recommended uh, by the consultant, they were saying that over about a 10-year period, we could see as many as 672 new students. So uh, the question is, where are we three years later? And so uh, the, the numbers that are reported by the Department of Education for fall enrollment, you can kind of see it in that, that middle number in red. And then again, we did the comparison below for each uh, time period, both that recommended and moderate. And again, you can kind of throw some of the numbers out during the pandemic or the heightened of it because the the drop. And you can see you kind of climbed back in 22 and 23 as it's reflected to 1920. Uh, but as you go into 2023, what, what you'll basically see when you compare the recommended or moderate based upon the actual number is our sweet spot seems to be kind of in the middle of it. And so uh, it's, a, uh, it's a little higher uh, uh, or essentially right in, in the middle of those numbers um, as you're tracking that. So as you begin to kind of go back and revisit this tool, what total projection is going to look like? 
So the, the context that, that really is kind of almost mind-blowing to a certain degree, because it's hard to fathom that this is true. Um, but so if you go to 2010 to 2023, uh, over a 13-year period in the city of Suffolk, we've added over 6,800 new residential units. Uh, the population has increased uh, over 14,467. And then uh, this time, going back to 2010, we currently have 17 less students than we did at, at, uh, at that time. And so it, it's really interesting to, to see the numbers and kind of remind yourself that uh, there's a lot more that goes into this besides just construction. Construction, obviously, is something that has to be factored into and thought through. The other thing that's interesting is uh, we see it at our end is we're going through this again uh, very much so right now is the city's comprehensive plan. You can track that related to the, the numbers that we just talked about here to see some of the strategies the city has put in place related to density. And so you see that with uh, more multifamily that's come online uh, where density has been encouraged in certain areas. Typically, density does not bring along uh, school children uh, with it. The neighborhoods and the, the ability to cluster neighborhoods have been smaller lots, and so you typically don't see uh, children along with that as well, or less thereof. Uh, and so that's one of those uh, interesting tidbits is how the city is growing, some of the policies that are happening at the city level that maybe reflect upon at the school system. So again, a couple conclusion slides here as well um, on the next slide. So again, that census to census, 2010 to 2020, you can kind of see the difference between school population and Suffolk total population. And then dropping down to where we are in 2023 with a little over 99,000 people and the school population at 14.4. And then looking out into 2030 based upon the, the study that was done, I would tell you today, uh, if you needed to, to pick a number, it'd probably be around 14.7. So again, right in between that uh, recommended and moderate number, and that would be uh, in comparison to the, the population pushing at 102. At least those are some of the projections uh, out into 2030. So you know, taking um, some of the Terry's comments, where we really want to be as aggressive as we can and stretch dollars, we want to leave you with a couple questions. But before we get to that, uh, we look at the numbers again um, and, and, and looking at what the program capacity was that was represented in the study, the current enrollment, and what the proposed capacity would be for these replacement of the schools and what the delta is between that. And there may be some nuances of uh, what's occurring uh, from education uh, at the schools. However, I think in order to stretch our dollars and build as much as we can, as aggressively as we can, um, we, we, we focus in on that when we um, receive the, the CIP uh, and compare it to some of the city programs. And so I, I think we wanted to kind of leave a couple of questions out there for discussion as we strategize about future programs uh, coming on because it's a pretty hefty uh, rebuild or build program that uh, that the school wants to uh, partake and that we would like to support. And so, as we've mentioned, many many variables come into play as it relates to student projections. And so, we want to uh, ensure that school construction capacities also take some of those projections into play. And some of that could be uh, reflected in how uh, you're educating uh, students today. And then, in order to stretch those dollars, does it uh, it, is it makes sense to dig in really deep and have some tough questions about rehab and expansions versus only just looking at, at rebuilds. And that's something that uh, yourselves in the political body will have to, to dig into. But um, with that in context, we kind of want to, to, to put those questions out there. Thank you. That ends our portion of the presentation. We turn it to the okay. boards. Yeah, before we uh, go into the disposition process, uh, at this time, we're we'll around the table, and if, if no one has any objection, we'll start with the school board. On this side, I'll allocate you up to five minutes just to be mindful of the time, give everybody ample opportunity to respond, and then we can um, you be just call up whoever you'd like to call up, ask whatever questions you want to ask, and then. After that, we'll do council and a 
open it up for additional comments, if necessary, and also comments from the superintendent and the city manager as well. So with that being said, we start with uh, Dr. Brooks Buck. Do you have any questions or comments or anyone you'd like to ask of? I do have uh, I do have some questions with regard to I, I know I asked these questions before. Is that I don't know what green is on it. Hit it again, Lee. Well it's supposed to be green. Red or green. There you go. Green. Okay. I did have some questions with regard to the CIP and looking at replacing schools. Of course, our schools that are 50 years old and older, looking at rehab would probably be just as expensive as looking at rebuilding because so many other things happened 50 years ago, 55 years ago, that aren't healthy, aren't safe, aren't appropriate right now. We have, for instance, with um, Elephant's Fourth School, I was in there. Uh, as we went over there, we had 300 children using the same bathroom during the day, which is almost, I would say, not almost, but impossible uh, on a regular basis. And so they have to do some other things that are not appropriate. As we look beside these schools with the mobile units outside, children are going in and out all day long. Uh, there are some several concerns with regard to that. So as we look at replacing things, uh, those things need to be considered. But my questions had to do with the space and making determinations about the space. When we talk about uh, looking at aging schools and looking at how we decide how many children can go into a school, as a former special education teacher, it always appeared that my room was never counted the fact that we counted, say, 24 children go into this particular class and 18 children go into this particular class. Well, I was a special education teacher, so eight children went into my class. Are those things considered as we look at when we were talking about the programmatic model? And I wanted to, I was elated to hear that, but that's what I wanted to know, if that was. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brooks Buck, and you're exactly correct. Um, when we look at the classrooms, one of the things that Dr. Bird and Mr. Napier and the team were referring to for the functional program capacity is the actual class size based on DOE regulations. So for kindergarten through third grade, for example, 23 students is our max. For fourth and fifth grade, 28 students is our max, but for separate public schools, we try to keep it at 25 to 1. Uh, what Dr. Brooks Buff just mentioned is, is exactly correct. For special education self-contained, that's 10 students. But that's 10 students in a 25 normal capacity size classroom. So uh, if it was a, uh, an inclusion classroom, the special education population couldn't go over 15, for example, at 60%. Uh, we also have early start in all of our uh, elementary schools, and that's no larger than 18 students. But again, that would be in a normal classroom that would hold 25. And for CSEP, which as we know was also housed at John F. Kennedy Middle School, uh, that would be 10 students. So those are some of the, the caveats that we have when it comes to functional capacity based on Department of Education regulations and also disabilities of the students. And not just 10 students, but how many adults, depending on the disability, and whether they have wheelchairs, whether they have other things. All of those things have to be considered, and I was just wondering, when we talked about space, because that was one of those teachers rolling around the hall, because there was no space, and it wasn't included in the calculation. The other thing is military families. Having been a military family, moving in and out, how do we calculate those kinds of things when we decide that a neighborhood needs whatever they need? I think it's been one of the things over the years that may have been miscalculated with regard to whatever we did. I remember when the Joint Forces changed whatever they changed and we had that wonderful, big, beautiful building over by my house that stayed vacant for years. Now VDOT is in it, but it stayed vacant for years. But houses in the neighborhood stayed vacant. So I, those are things that, that may not have been planned. I remembered asking questions as well about the the formula that we used for deciding that children lived in the house if we were building apartments, that maybe children weren't in there. It wasn't a three to four bedroom house. However, I know that our yellow buses stop in Hampton Roads, that Hampton Roads area where the new apartments are, and they pick up people from aged 
5 to 18 all day long, all the time. So I don't know how we can be more, I guess, more determined, more focused in determining how well that formula works with those confounding variables that affect the end result and how we can do something about that because that usually is a problem as well as the size of the city and where schools are located and what we can do when people say just redistrict when I'm thinking of moving people from northern shores or moving people from where would they go how far would they be away from home what are we talking about doing so I mean there have been some ideas thrown up uh, over the years, not just this year, but over the years, about easy fixes for programs that have not really been easy fixes. So I just, those are things that have been on my mind with regard to this. I do appreciate the projects that we're doing, and um, I texted Mayor Newman as soon as we got the $15 million extra money to say, this is wonderful when we work together. This is the kind of thing we can get uh, when we got the extra $15 million for uh, John F. Kennedy, for the building of John F. Kennedy. And so I'm excited about the fact that we're trying to get another grant as well to help us with more building. Thank you. Board Member Jenkins. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you all for um, the meeting, for us to come together and discuss such an important topic and that is our stuff of public schools and bonding and making things making things collaborative with our city. Um, one of the major things here for the city is our public schools. We have more students in public school than any other uh, capacity and so coming together and bringing facts to the table um, and taking it seriously even though some say this is a wish list but it's some things that definitely needs to be done. And one of the concerns, and thank you for John F. Kennedy for us breaking ground and what you've done to make that happen because we talked about that several times um, over and over at our previous meeting. So thank you for moving forward with that. But one of the things that concerns me as well as Dr. Buck um, brought up are the trailers for the schools. And so I would just like to know what are the conditions that they are in right now and what are we doing or thinking about doing moving forward. We know it's um, probably less expensive maybe to do something other than to build another school even though we need many new schools to be built. Um, but at this time, um, what are we doing to make sure that they are safe because the safety of our students as well as our teachers and administrators, um, staff is important. So in this weather that we're coming up with now in the winter where they have to go back and forth um, outside, um, I don't think they have bathrooms as I think we, they don't have bathrooms. So what, what is something that we can do at this point uh, moving forward and are we putting that in the plan? Um, we see the schools that's listed with them. So what can we do at this point? That's one of my concerns. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins, for, for bringing that up. And um, for members of council that may not have been aware, that was one of the main reasons why the board had made adjustments in their capital improvement request was mainly based on the total number of mobile units. And that's why Elephants Fork Elementary School uh, was changed and moved up as compared to last year with those 12 mobile units. Uh, those mobile units in 90% of the cases are 25 years old. They were meant to be a temporary solution. But based on some funding challenges that the city has had, you know, before my time and before many of our members of the board who have been on the board, they have stayed in place. And Mr. Napier's team actually spends an extensive amount of time over every break and every summer and before every season changes to ensure that there's no HVAC issues, there's no insulation issues, there's no leaks. Elephants Fork actually had uh, 13, but we put one out of commission. Northern Shores had 14, but we put one out of commission because they have to be checked really weekly and monthly to make sure that, that there aren't any issues. And at this point in time, it costs about $150,000 for each mobile unit that you set up. So that's fiscally irresponsible for us to even think about making that an option. 
Um, so the, the safety issues that Ms. Jenkins has brought up is why we have uh, increased our total number of safety staff in our buildings that are, are there to make sure any of our students are transitioning in and out. Uh, as Dr. Brooks Buck mentioned, that was part of what we discovered at Elephant's Fork on Take Your Legislator to School Day last year when Ms. Bilby pointed out the 300 students that had to use that particular restroom because that particular restroom was closest to the 12 mobile units that were outside. Um, so as we begin to look at this, you know, one of the things you heard Dr. Bird talk about is the change in projections or based on current enrollment in Mac Ben. Mac Ben only has three mobile units, for example, but at 715, they actually need more. We had to have a meeting with Mr. Rose to determine what we could potentially do with an additional classroom if necessary because Ms. Pichon was working to make sure that there was that teacher to student ratio stayed uh, below the thresholds that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So having the mobile units has been a main factor in the school board making their decisions on where schools were going to fall on our CIP requests. The second part, of course, was going to be the actual maintenance cost that Mr. Napier's team needs to do to maintain not only the building, but those mobile units as well. And then, of course, the third major indicated was the fac uh, facility conditions index. So mobile units are playing a big role, but every year we delay, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars that are having to be spent for upkeep for something that does not even match our functional pro program capacity. Thank you. And in closing, I just, you know, I just want to say again, thank you for um, City Council and what you've done. But just to know that when we as school board members and Dr. Gordon and our chair, we come to you with our plans, it's not just something that we're just trying to write down. We really consider putting our students and our, our staff and everybody first. So we, we really, really need the funds that we're asking for. And so we appreciate you considering that and taking it for how we're bringing it to you and moving forward. Anything that we can do to help move it forward even faster, we appreciate it. Board member Dr. Brittingham. Thank you. Um, so a lot of information. Um, she makes good money. My biggest concern at this point. You need to get you to hit your microphone. To, turns green. There you go. There we go. There. Okay. My biggest concern is still some of the capacity issues that we have at our schools. Um, and in looking at the newest data that's come in this year, um, we have more schools that are going further into overcapacity. And so, um, I appreciate this presentation and, and talking about how we're going to meet those needs in the next five years. Um, but inside of that five years, I think that we also need to look carefully at how maybe we can move some of these things forward faster, especially when we're dealing with some schools being 120% over capacity. That's a safety issue to me, seeing that. Um, so I, I would love to see the city council and the school board collaborating um, closer on these things uh, on a yearly basis because I don't think one meeting or two meetings is, is really going to solve <laughs> what we have going on here. And um, this is something that we definitely need to be planning uh, for not just in a, in a five-year projection, but on a yearly basis looking and reassessing because um, some of these buildings are 50 years old. And my, my concern is is that that becomes a safety issue or problem um, in and of itself. And so the sooner that we can go through and, and do things like we're doing with JFK, um, but JFK is not the only school that really needs our attention. So um, I appreciate the hard work that council is doing to, um, to work with the school board. And um, I appreciate the, the, the firm that we have that's overseeing this to give us some insight on how to move forward um, with, with these issues. Um, but again, my biggest concern right now is that we've got overcapacity in a lot of schools and that's going to start presenting other problems and issues uh, for us uh, with the student uh, disciplines and, and health issues, you know, over time. Um, so anyway, thank you. You're welcome. Board Member Slingoff. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much. 
Um, I want to thank everyone that's pulled together the presentations and has presented this information tonight. I know from myself I've gained um, some clearer insight into several areas, and I'm very grateful. Um, very excited about JFK, as everybody's mentioned. And I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but I would echo what my colleagues have already spoken with regards to safety. Um, the two top her top issues for me, again, would be capacity, like uh, Dr. Brittingham has said, and also the mobile units that Ms. Jenkins has mentioned. Both of those are very alarming for different reasons um, with safety. So I understand our limitations, but um, I'm hoping that we can bring some resolve um, for some of these schools that are dealing with both of those issues predominantly. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Vice Chairman Hill. Thank you. Um, again, I'm not going to echo what's already been said. I think we all agree. We don't want our kids in mobile units. We don't want our kids in moldy, leaky buildings. Um, we don't want our kids stuffed into overcrowded buildings and and the issues that, that follow there. But we are, you know, all here with the same set of concerns. And our job that we were elected to do is to come up with solutions. Um, I, I see on the northern end of town, redistricting wouldn't help. We can't send our kids somewhere else that you know, the new neighborhoods come in into driver. They're going to go to schools in driver. It wouldn't make sense to do redistricting there. We don't have funds, of course, for a new building in that area. So I, I just ask, as we are growing as a city, people have been moving here for years. I mean, I grew up here. People have been moving here from places like Virginia Beach, Great Bridge, Greenbrier, because it's crowded out there and there's traffic and they move here for some fresh air and some land and, and space to raise their families and, and good schools and reflect, are we becoming that? Um, I, I think we have to find balance in growth and being able to handle the growth that we are allowing um, in our city, in our schools. Um, in the community because it's taxing on all the resources that you all are responsible for. I don't envy your position at all. This one is hard enough. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the difficulty that you all face each year when you have to look over our requests, our CIP requests, and, and then figure out how to make it work and how to prioritize. Um, there's a solution in here somewhere, and the more we talk about it, I think the closer that we get to it, and it does require each and every one of us to compromise and approach this table with a little bit of humility and a willingness to um, sacrifice some things that may be more important to us but aren't necessarily the most important overall for the city as a whole. And, and that's just part of what we're supposed to be doing here for our citizens and especially for our kiddos. Mm -hmm. They deserve it. Which everybody? Uh, thank you for all the information that has come forth thus far, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question I have is which borough in the city um, are we projecting to see the highest population growth and what impact does that have on the schools that are located in the borough? I understand that the city is growing, but I didn't see what we actually honed in as requested on the information as far as which barrel we see growth. We know Northern Suffolk is pretty much tapped out. So where do we look next? Because if you're building new schools, there's no need to build a new school in an area that we don't want growth in in 30 years. So which area or which barrel, to be exact, do we project to see the highest <laughs> population growth in the city? That's my first question. So the, uh, related to the, the schools question, uh, I would direct your attention to the, the study that was performed. It does have subsets that break down the schools that are in there. I, I, we, you know, what we showed here in kind of the three-year look forward about where the trajectory is and how it's following, you can uh, go back to that study and see what those impacts are broken down by school. And it just probably would take uh, a little bit of matching to make sure that's all uh, following suit. And so the, it's in the study that was performed. Um, those predictions are, I, I, 
fairly accurate that we've seen this far. Regarding the city's growth, I think what you're beginning to see is uh, an increase in activity in and around the, the central city. Um, Godwin specifically, we're seeing some activity down Pitch Kettle as well. There's still some pockets of growth in the northern Suffolk, down Shoulders Hill Road as well. Um, from a density perspective, uh, one of the things that uh, we saw during the pandemic was an increase in activity in the rural areas. And so uh, that was kind of a, a, a new one for us, seeing that interest. Now that Internet's going out there, you'll see probably a little more interest in there as well. Um, so the probably part of the answer is a little bit of everywhere. But as our densities are increasing in and around the central part of the city, Godwin, uh, but also still in northern Suffolk, so a little bit everywhere. That's not the answer I was hoping for. What I was hoping for was a actual nailed down growth because when we go back to the drawing board as a board we can't build a little bit everywhere for us as schools we have we have to have an area to focus in and with the, the acquisition of new land the longer we wait the higher the cost um, is to acquire that land so we want to know where do we need to set our eyes on for an example if we're going to open up the southern end of the city which has a lot of more virgin land to residential growth, then I believe the board should start looking its eyes there along with the city council and begin to have conversations to look at purchasing land before the development happened. Um, case in point is Oakland Elementary School. Chuck and Tuck, in my opinion, that's why I was asking you yours because you have more concrete numbers. In my opinion, Chuck and Tuck is growing. Oakland is pretty much landlocked now with development. Where do we build a new elementary school because you see the growth that is taking place with our neighbor Smithfield right at the border. So we want to be wise with the taxpayer dollars. Let's not wait until the growth busts us in the head at the doorstep, but let us anticipate the growth, secure the land. We probably can use it for another purpose until it's a need um, being there. Um, but that's why I wanted that. So maybe if possible I can follow up with the email and get more clarity. My next question is, is when we're deciding what school capacity, are we taking into account our mobile units? Because I believe this is something I heard most of all of us say, not just school board members, but city council, some city council members as well. We need to get rid of the mobile units. So if we get rid of the mobile units today, and all of our schools become at capacity, if we rezone, or I don't even think that's even possible or, or not, how does that impact the city's plans and development then? Because if Elephants Fork have 12 mobile units, it's 12 classrooms. That's 12 uh, square footage of learning. So if we get rid of those mobile units because they're aged out, what happens to the growth zone then? Do we still allow development to come in those areas? Or what's our long-term plan? I hope you follow me I think where so. I'm going. Yeah, so uh, the process, and I'll maybe ask uh, Kevin Weiner, planning director, to, to echo if I'm missing anything. So if there's an available piece of property that's asking for rezoning, uh, we do look at what current capacities are. We look at a pipeline projection based upon what we've had activity on that maybe hasn't come to fruition yet, and what that then adds to this new developing proposing a rezoning. Uh, and so I believe we do not... Correct me if I'm wrong on the the, the trailer section. Yeah, so we're looking at the structure itself, not that. So you you would be at capacity in the structure itself um, already, if that makes sense. But again, this is again related to a rezoning request. If the zoning is in place, it does not go through that process. And I really appreciate you sharing that part because that's probably been the you know the largest concern is that when capacity numbers for schools are calculated, mobile units are not. So, for example, Elephant's Fork, since that's one we've been talking about, as an example, if we look at 25 to 1, which is the basic number that we use based on some of those different code thresholds that I provided, 12 times 25, that's 300 kids outside. That's the 300 students that Dr. Brooks Buck was referring to that are using the bathroom. And uh, we also have to think about not only the safety issue of that, but just the flow of traffic. 
it makes things extremely hard for functional capacity and scheduling for our administrators to be able to use those buildings. So you know, I just want to make sure that council understands that when you see those mobile units in there at our elementary school level especially, majority of the time that's fourth and fifth graders because the administrators feel better about having those students outside like the best case scenario in a challenging situation. But it still can become an issue. Um, and when we are looking at building these schools, you know, our number for growth that we try to keep in mind is to make sure we have enough space for 200 to 250 seats. Uh, that will allow projected growth. You heard Dr. Brittingham mention uh, 50 years. 50 years is the threshold of a school if you do everything right, if you make sure that you have preventative maintenance every year that addresses things. But we all know that different fiscal years cause for different difficult, tough decisions, so sometimes that's not the case. And we have schools that are actually closer to 60 years old that need to be uh, looked at. So I want to just add that caveat, Mr. Riggs, to, to your question about capacity in our mobile units. Okay. Uh, my next question is, do we have any plans to make our communities uh, where schools are located more walkable communities. I brought this up before at a joint meeting, and I'm just following up again. The rationale behind bringing this up is not only does it improve the quality of life for the citizens, but it also gives Suffolk Public Schools another transportation option in regards to getting students to school. We could implement the program Safe Routes to School, which, make, which will allow students and parents to walk to school versus having to earmark and align buses to go in those areas that are in close proximity to schools. But if they don't have sidewalks or a safe route to get there, then we still have that item still on our budget that we can't or shift around. So is there a plan for that? So the, the, you know, the UDO has requirements as development comes online to add curb gutter sidewalks in place. A, a great example is if you've seen uh, the development that's occurred with the Publix out on, on Godwin Boulevard and Kensington that now connects to the, the neighborhood back there. You essentially, from the Kensington neighborhood, have a sidewalk all the way to Kings Fork High School. And I know uh, traffic's looking at the, uh, the ability to create a safer way between the middle school and the high school. And so that didn't exist last year, but because the UDO has that requirement in, you now have a safe method of travel via sidewalk to a neighborhood that didn't last year. And that's for pretty much new development. But another I want to dig into is the build by right. So if I buy a house in Hollywood, Jericho area that does not have sidewalks and I tear the house down and want to put up a newer house or something of that sort and there's still no sidewalks there. Or, you know, if I buy um, homes closer to Booker T or some homes that's closer to Mac Bend, um, do we have anything in place to get kids that live in the community across the street from Mac Ben safely to Mac Ben if they decided to walk? So a couple of methods that we look at at that. So infield development doesn't necessarily have the same requirement. Uh, however, uh, the CIP features a number of sidewalk projects in there. We've got a Pewsville uh, area sidewalk program that I believe we're proposing to roll out from a design and construction. And then I know Public Works is very aggressive at looking an, an, at grants to build or fill in some of those spaces. And so we share your interest and concern about uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, my follow-up now, I'm Dr. Gordon. I'm glad you brought up about the general life of a school being 50 years. I know some would refer to our neighboring localities such as Norfolk and other divisions that have schools that far dates 50 years that are still in operation. But from my conversation with them, they're having a lot of financial um, concerns to operate those schools. Have you seen anything in the trend? I don't know if it, this question is for you or our city manager here, but I know we have a 100-year-old facility that was built in the, as a school in 1921 or 22, but it's still operable now. And I see we are there's a one point something million dollar construction renovation going to help with the wet brick. Do you know if renovating the schools would be worthwhile with what we have versus what's currently going on in our city with the preservation of old structures? 
Let me try to address that, Kevin. Um, uh, Chairman, uh, I think, and I think your consultants could probably could talk to you a little bit about this, but I think each structure is unique in itself. If you take Elephant's Fork, which in my opinion is located in the wrong spot, but uh, because of the traffic concerns on Route 10 and then parents coming in like. But if you take a look, I, you know, I haven't been in Forest Glen, but I don't know whether that type of structure, if you stripped it down and brought it back, could be rehabilitated or not. You know, I think each structure you take a look at because each structure is in its own type of condition. Uh, and, and maybe as we go through different projects, we have to, a couple years ahead of time, take your evaluation on which way we go. Um, when you talked about uh, Oakland a little, a little while ago. I'm sorry, I'm going to get off topic here with you. But you talked about Oakland a little while ago and the build-out. Oakland is still a village in, in, a, in a certain area. It's not uh, part of the urban suburban development area. It's a village in its own self. So there's only a certain amount of development can happen in that, in that area. But I think what's key going on right now is our comp plan revision that itself helps us direct where growth goes. So um, we're going to have different areas that's going to expand a little bit probably. Can't say that yet until council takes a look at it in the beginning of the year. But um, from a residential aspect, I think Kevin was right on point as we see more around the core city. So as we talk about Elephant's Fork, as we talk about um, Kilby Shores and we look at those different areas, you're going to see more development there and maybe it's an opportunity to take a look because both of those have traffic issues around them and say, what should we really do? As we look at some of the other schools, um, again, going back to your original question, I think each school brings a unique opportunity or no opportunity on rehab. The reason, the reason why I brought that, that up far as Oakland, um, Oakland students are not just coming from the village of Chequotuck. You also have some Oakland students who come from off of Kings Walk Road, and as that area grow, those students are routed to Oakland because there may not be enough capacity at the other two schools, which is either at capacity or approaching the threshold of capacity. But I'm going to defer because I don't want to overextend my time. Too late. You didn't stop me. I'm giving you a break. I'm letting you, I'm letting you use your other board members' time. Well, I appreciate it. So I keep going on. Yeah, that's good. Let me know. What would you want? Uh, what do we have? 120. That's where, if you could wrap it up. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here. Then we'll come back around. I appreciate you. I do want to say thank you um, to City Council for working with us to make JFK happen. But I do want us to sit down and come with come up with a realistic, tangible plan that addresses the key elephant in the room, school system facility infrastructure, and making sure we're on task and that we're building in the right locations. Um, and I think we're taking a, the step in the right direction in doing that. I know um, the mayor and I have had a lot of conversation about making that happen. But the other piece is joint use facility and joint usage. Uh, and I'm going to stop there. I just want to put it on your radar that I'm going to be bringing it up soon. Council Member Rector, I'm going to come back around the other way. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in dealing with this issue, you know, I feel a little bit like I've come to a wrestling match against an octopus. Um, the problems that uh, you know we face as a city and the problems that the school system faces uh, are multifaceted um, and as such from going around and listening to everybody uh, in this room at least from the school board side speak the the solutions are going to be multifaceted um, I, you know I think right now everybody seems to be concerned at least as terms of where the CIP uh, is projected to be in the next five years that the elementary school level is one of the critical areas that we need to take a look at. Um, and I guess it's specifically Elephant's Fork uh, Elementary School and Kilby Shores Elementary School. And I agree with the city manager. I don't think that the current location of Elephant's Fork elementary school is really a safe suitable spot to have an elementary school I, it was one of my polling places um, during the election last year and I was almost afraid to get back out on uh, route 10 coming out of that parking lot um, so I can understand the you know the potential 
desire and need to relocate that school facility and so that also does you know does that present an opportunity to do something more creative with that school and with Kilby Shores Elementary School because if you look at the replacement cost of those two schools at 800 student capacity that gives you 1600 students and the projections you know are somewhere around 1100 to 1150 students combined for those two schools um, so I, I think an opportunity is there perhaps to maybe do a two for one and I know that that's one of the facility recommendations that was put out in that um, facility study that was done back in 2020 um, you know suffix you know once again is you know we're a little bit of a victim of our own success um, we are the city in the Hampton Roads area that has the land to expand our population with the addition of 664 the monitor Merrimack bridge tunnel we have easy access to Virginia Beach, Norfolk, <coughs> and now Newport News in Hampton. So it, it creates a very inviting opportunity for, as you said, for the people that want to come from Chesapeake. My Lord, I went to Greenbrier last night for a six o'clock meeting, and it took me about an hour um, from once I got to Bowers Hill to get to the Greenbrier Road exit. And, you know, for those people, that's a daily occurrence. Um, you know, fortunately for us, we don't have that kind of a kind of a traffic problem and I guess that's one of the things that makes us makes us attractive um, and looking at the five-year CIP I mean it, it's clear there's a little bit of a difference um, in what the expectations from the school board are and what the uh, expectation for deliverance from the City Council is I mean it's almost a 60 60 some million dollar gap um, you know, ergo, I think that's going to also require some flexibility, um, you know, both on the council's part, perhaps to maybe make some funding rearrangements, but also um, is going to perhaps require some flexibility on the school board's side to try to figure out something else that we could possibly do with some of these facilities and, and where they're going. And with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Council Member Fawcett. You really want me to go there, huh? Well, first off, I'm going to thank everybody for today. It's great to see everybody, and hopefully you all have a great holiday season coming up. And just a key on a couple of things that I've heard, and, um, you know, it was a heavy lift to get to JFK to get that building off the ground and built because the, the pricing on that facility just went from one end of the spectrum to a level that I don't think we were expecting to see, but with creativity and, 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 and grants, we were able to get to that point. Grants is the thing. We're going to have to continue to pursue as much grant money as there is out there that may be available because it is hard to get money from state and feds. It's, it's, it's a challenge. It's you think the money is free flowing, but it's not always the same as you might think. You know, I, I, I want to echo what some of you have said, and I, and I won't disagree with you that I think the mobile structures are problematic. I think they're problematic, as you say, for student movement, if nothing else, uh, students. And we've had portable classrooms in Suffolk for quite some time. It's nothing new to us, but we, I know what we're trying to do is to uh, try to mitigate as many of them as we can. And it is tough because it becomes a problem with the children have to use facilities and at the same time the security mechanism today around these schools, it makes it much more difficult from the security side when you have a portable classroom, particularly when it's just pretty much open to the outside. Um, I, I've looked at that back in the days when we had a number of them over there in, uh, in the north end of, of Suffolk, for sure. Um, so I'm not a big fan of mobile units. I'll be the first one to tell you. I'm just not a fan of them for that reason alone. Um, the safety and the capacity is certainly an issue. There's no question. I'll be the first one to admit to you, I wish we could build 
today a school for everything that we have an issue with that's sitting in front of us and may be coming in the future. But is it realistic? It's not. It's not realistic right at the moment. Uh, we have to work within the, the budget dollars that we have. And I look at it from uh, a standpoint that, one, we want to attract people, of course, to come to Suffolk. Uh, we don't have to do much to get them to come here. They'll, they'll, they'll find their way here because it's a great city to live in. But two, they're, the taxpayers is what's happening to make this possible to us to get to where we want to go. But along with that, we have to have businesses to continue to come here. We have to promote that product of businesses coming here. And what we have to look at, and council has been kind of dealing with, if you've been kind of paying attention, we've had a lot of pushback in growth. People that are against growth, don't want growth, don't want this here, don't want it there, don't put it in my backyard. It makes it very difficult as a council member sitting up on this dais when you have developers that have come here and built Suffolk. Developers have built Suffolk, not any individuals. Developers have built Suffolk, whether it's business or homes. They've done a great job coming to the city to do it. And a lot of people, in some cases, have pushed back against developers because they don't like a cluster in a certain place or whatever. And, you know, if we're, we're going to grow, we've got to have this tax base in order to get there. We've got to have the growth. We've got to have all these mechanisms. If we don't, we're not going to have the money to build new schools. They're not going to come any cheaper. The school prices are going to continue to escalate and escalate and escalate, just like a home is or just like the businessman that's going to build a rather large business. So, you know, look at it from the economic standpoint where we're sitting in the country today, prices are spiraling. They're just, you can't go anywhere. You don't see pricing going crazy. We're all dealing with it. I don't care where you go. Whether you go buy something in a store, clothing, or you go buy groceries, or you go buy an automobile or try to buy a house today, try that, for instance. It's getting very difficult. So my hope is that we can continue. We want to grow our city in a, um, a way that's appealing to everyone. And that's what I hope the 2045 plan is. It's on the move. It's going to come out. And that may help us in a way to tell where we can and can't go, uh, where we could maybe go in a different area. But, you know, some of our outlying areas don't have facilities. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have sewer. They don't have water. Most people out in these outlying areas are on water of uh, wells. Some are community, but most of them are on their own wells. Then you have septic systems, which, you know, if you think for a minute you're going to go out to maybe Whaleyville or out to uh, a deep part of Holland or Chuckatuck, that's going to be problematic to get those kind of utilities in places where there is land that could basically help us uh, spread out um, our, our structures, our buildings, and our businesses. So when people come here to look, unfortunately, you know, all of them uh, – particularly businesses, don't tell us how they're going to do business. They just tell us what they want to do. It's up to us to help try to facilitate it and get it where it needs to go. So, you know, I think what we can, if we can do anything, you know, we're going to be, a, after JFK, we're going to have to take a breath and figure out <laughs> where we go next because that's a pretty price tag. And keep in mind that, you know, we still are paying on the debt. The debt is not going to go away. The debt is a mounting debt that has to be done. And you got to realize that we're only bouncing up against that 35. We increased it from 30 to 35. So there's a problematic issue there. And then getting bonds for schools and things of this nature is still going to cost you money. It's still going to wind up doing it. So anyway, just, the mayor's trying to get me to wrap up. But that's just my two cents. But I thank everybody, and I hope that maybe – We'll find better solutions as we move forward in the next few years.
Okay. Thank you. Councilman Williams. Thank you. There's a couple of questions that I have, but first of all, let me thank the, uh, the school system and city staff for putting together this proposed uh, CIP submission. Um, I want to echo off what um, my fellow <coughs> councilman uh, just said. If we could build all the schools that's needed, if we had the funding right now, I would vote for it. But we don't. And realist realistically, we're stewards over the city's finances, and we have to act appropriately and, and make sure that we manage the city and its funding and its budget um, in a professional manner. Um, with that said, um, on the for school CIP submission, um, in particular, the major system repair um, and replacement, I noticed in 2027 through 2028, um, the uh, requested amount is $7 million. And then in 2028 to 2029, there's another $7 million. And then the five-year projection was $14 million. But when I look at the, um, the city um, proposed expenditures for the same thing, it says the previous um, funding was $17,987. And um, in year 2027 to 2028, it's $5 million. And another one, $5 million in 2028 to 2029, which is a total of $10 million. So my question, uh, two-part question. Um, the first part of my question is where, we are, where are we now with that funding? Okay, that's it. City Manager. The current, uh, as you recall, last year, working with uh, the school system, Dr. Gordon and I had discussions. We moved the maintenance funding so elephants, I mean, not elephants, northern shores could move forward, forward. So the maintenance money that was shown in the first three years were moved to northern shores, allow that to, that project to move ahead. Now, um, uh, Dr. Gordon and staff proposed $7 million on the out two years this year. In the CIP, we did put it in at five million. If you recall, we used to do a million, then it went to three and a half mm -hmm. uh, million recently. So we moved it to five in our CIP, thinking that was the next logical step. The, the reason that was there at five, and then in the outer years, we've moved it up to seven and, and so forth. Uh, but the first three years, I think, uh, Dr. Gordon, I think you agree with me. We moved that to northern shores. E yes, and Councilman Williams, you know, I really appreciate you asking that question because that was something I was going to talk about. Um, just to provide some, some justification for that, uh, Mr. Moore is right where that money for the preventive maintenance at 3.575, which also includes like asbestos removals and stuff like that, was used to fund Northern Shore. The main reason we requested $7 million is because you're looking at four years of not having that 3.75. Um, so we just did the math and said $7 million to make up for those years because we're basically pulling from funds, as you've seen, we've put in year-end requests to you all in the city to reappropriate that money back to us for any fund balance money so that we can do some of this preventative maintenance money that we no longer have. The other concern why we also put it at $7 million is because those mobiles are 25 million years old, 25 years old. <laughs> That'd be something. And we know that we're going to have to actually replace those within the next five years for some of these schools. And so at 150000 now, Mm -hmm. a pop that increases that total request to five million now one of the things that the city manager did share with the mayor and mr Riddick and i is uh, they're going to consider the potential use of cash to make up for some of that difference for preventive maintenance this is hvac this is roof repair mm -hmm. these are other things that we are really using any end of the year operating funds any fund balance just to make up for and we've tried to be very strategic. Ms. Forsman is brilliant at using some of the money that we have for CARES Act to pay it forward for some of those things so that we could afford to not have preventative maintenance money in those years. But that $2 million difference that you're referring to is definitely going to be a point of discussion that we probably need to continue to have over the next couple of years. Okay. Well, you answered my second part of the question, so I'll, I, that's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. And I'll be brief. Well, while we're talking about the, you know, when Northern Shores is complete, there are no more units there, correct? 
That is the plan because where the units are is where the expansion will go. Okay, so the units will go away. So my proposal is that as the units go away, we don't ever put them back. <clears throat> we do something different. You come back and we figure it out because if, if to me it's a real it, it's it's a real sore spot on this city that we have these units. Um, Elements Fork bothers me to no end. I would not send my child there because of the units. I'm sorry. It is not the way to run a school system. So we've got to fix it. Okay. Just throw that out first. I, that, it bothers me. Forest Glen, there's no, there's no reason to have units there anymore. That school with school capacity and everything that's there, let's get rid of them. They were there when I was there. It is time that we move into this century, and we can do better. Um, CIP, I'll go back to the CIP concerns with Elephants Fork, Kilby Shores. Both schools have real problems, and I think we can't look at one without looking at the other. We have a traffic problem at Kilby Shores that is way beyond what anybody here knows. And our teachers and our staff that does a tremendous job to keep it moving, but the community is sick of it, and it's really not fair to that community. Elephants Fork is kind of the same way. So I, I do agree that we, when looking at one school, let's look at two schools. Maybe we can combine the two schools. Maybe put them on a larger site. Or maybe one of my points today was we go back to, at one point in my life, we talked about campus-style schools, where we had two or three schools on a site. Why, why can't we do that? With the traffic today and with the congestion today and the fact that these school sites are too visible, why don't we put them on sites where they're not all so visible? And we have a couple of possibilities here in the city. And I, I, I'd be happy to be a part of that if it were to happen. But um, that was my other points. As long as, as well as the maintenance and the expansion, I, I don't like to see that maintenance money be used for something else because in my mind, we don't do the maintenance we should. Our schools need to be maintained. And we talked about, you talk about Norfolk and 100 year old schools, 150 year old schools. I don't propose that that's what we look toward, but I think we can do a better job of keeping what we've got. In particular, we've got a couple of schools here now at Forest Glen, in my mind, I, I would hate to see that school torn down. If you go into the structure itself, the structure itself is solid. Um, and they probably tell me I'm wrong. But why can't we look outside the box and at least try to come up with some plans to do things a little differently? This world is changing, and we're not going to always be able to build a $75 million school. So consequently, we need to look after the ones that we have a little bit better than what we do. And in, in, in making those schools grow, maybe change the way we look at it. That's one thing Mr. Hughes said that I, I did agree with. Should we consider school rehabilitations and expansions versus only total rebuilds to make the most of limited CIP dollars? Um, we've got to do it. But I'm also not of the opinion that we built, we're building one school right now and that's all we can do for a while. We've got to do something to maintain these other schools. We've got some problems and we need to fix them. How, I don't know, but we can by working together, I hope. Um, what was the other thing? That's it. I'm going to be quiet. Thank you, guys. This, this was a great meeting. I'm glad to be a part of it. I know we need to work together, and we want to work together, and I want to see our schools expand and grow. But um, growth is all over our city, so your point was well made, but the growth is going to be all over the city. Now. We've got to consider where the sites are. That's why I say campuses. We have campuses. This is where we go to school in each camp, each region of the city. So maybe we need to reinvent ourselves and look at it. Thank you. Council Member Bennett. Thank you. I think who took <coughs> most of my time? You right there? What's that now? Ask me, do you take most of my time? <coughs> I think I was right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I, I, I don't have much. Uh, but I really want to start out asking a question. I know every year we come together to sit and talk. It seems like the student population is decreasing, but the uh, population citywide is increasing. And the numbers, to me, with the number of houses and apartments that's being built, it's hard for me to fathom in my mind that there's no growth there with students. So where, where are they going? What, what's happening? Can anybody give me a general idea of what's happening the birth rate the amount of growth we have private school numbers so I didn't intentionally leave this slide up but essentially there's a, there's a yeah perception is not always reality um, the world's changed you know people are having less less kids uh, that kind of has been occurring 
um, less births. Uh, people are transitioning at different times. You know, uh, a student doesn't always stay K through uh, 12 in a school system, and so there's transition that's occurring, especially in an area like Hampton Roads because of the military coming and going. Um, and so I, 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 it's kind of one of the reasons we wanted to go revisit this, because I do recall when we rolled this out, the consultant talked about these projections. Uh, the reaction, mine as well, was like, there's no way that's right. Um, so that's why we wanted to look at it three years later. Is it right? And, and it is, um, believe it or not. Uh, there's trends coming and going. Uh, we have seen some changes. I think I think I heard someone uh, kind of talking about uh, homeschooling. So uh, as the pandemic kicked in, you saw the number around 500 because <clears throat> it's reported in Suffolk jump to the thousands. Um, that number has stayed at thousand uh, even post pandemic. And so there's 500 kids that are no longer being accounted for in the school system. So some of those things, life is changing, people are changing, uh, technology, if you know, family styles, things of that nature. It's a rapidly changing world for sure. Thank you, sir. Good answer. Uh, again, I would just like to say uh, thanks to everyone coming out this afternoon to sit and give us a round the table discussion of what your needs are, then you'll get a general idea of what the city can afford. Then we have to come in and get to a happy medium where we have a certain dollar amount in the budget. We cannot exceed that. So we have to work within our parameters of that. So I think everybody needs to know what the manager and the council bottom line is dollar wise that we have to spend. So I know it's a lot here that you are asking for. I totally support what you're asking for. It's needed. And I, I'm just like the rest of them. I can't get Elephant Park out of my mind because when I went out there last year and saw what those kids were going through, to me, it should have been brought back to the top of the list after John F. Kennedy. It should have went all the way to the top. <clears throat> Not taking anything from Northern Shores. No. But uh, no. that school is really, really... Those kids, I feel sorry for the parents to have to send the kids out there because it's unsafe and the condition there with safety, really, with those buildings outside, uh, it's a big concern of mine. I don't have any kids there, but with all those kids going in and out of that building just to go to the bathroom. So it's a big concern. I think you need to really look at sooner than later what we all can come together and say, look, Let's try to prioritize some things here and try to put that school back on uh, up front where it can be done a little bit sooner, I hope. So uh, I was glad to see that John F. Kennedy groundbreaking went well, and that was back to maintenance. I think if you go in that school, when I used to go in that school, I could see the maintenance was not maintained in that building like it should have been. That's the worst next to uh, Elephant Park. Of the maintenance on the buildings look like that I had been in. So now with the new school being built, I'm hoping that uh, that will take some of the people that in some of the overcrowded schools that's going to want to go to John F. Kennedy School that didn't want to go to John F. Kennedy School as it has, as it is now. So I'm hoping that that will encourage more people to uh, want their student their children to go to John F. Kennedy School. Uh, I, I know that uh, how many schools have we looked at, how many schools that can be added on rather than to build new schools in that system? How many schools do we have that we can have additional added on to, like National River and some of the other schools? Have that been looked at to bring forth, said, okay, we can go and build X number of classrooms <coughs> on to uh, National River, and then Forest Glen or wherever. Have that been looked at where we had the land? Yeah, thank you for that question, Mr. Bennett. So that actually was one of the conversations that we had when the facilities study was actually first completed in 2020. And what uh, RRMM and Cooperative Strategies both told us is you're not getting the best bang for your buck if you do that. And Land-wise, we can actually rebuild every school that we have on the current property, but we do also have some concerns about entrance and exit in, in doing that. And then there was going to be the concern on the age specifically of the roof and HVAC system 
where replacing those would be at multiple different times, which would then cause a higher burden on our overall preventative maintenance money that Mr. Johnson was, was, was just talking about. Um, and I'll just be honest, you know, I kind of promised the board that I'm big on rebuilding. And I try to tend to keep my promises. Um, but Natsman River High School is an area, and if Lakeland ever got to that point because of the design <coughs> of the building, those two schools have the best capacity to be able to have an expansion put on. It might be something based on the information that was shared from Dr. Bird and Mr. Napier that we may have to look at for MacBent because MacBent is a school that's further down the facility condition index and there's also room on that site to do so. So those will probably be the three main schools that staff will more than likely be open to taking a look at. Thank you much. I, I think that's something that's worthwhile taking a look at. And uh, so I would hope that uh, we would take a serious look at that and try to move forward with that as well. Uh, also, I uh, want to congratulate you again on the grant writer, whoever your grant writer is, for getting the grant. I hope you continue on doing that. So when we get ready to build these other schools that we'll be able to uh, get more grant money working with the city, city uh, manager, and all working together as a team to try and get more uh, <coughs> grant money for uh, like we did at the John F. Kennedy School where in that uh, we'll be able to uh, really get some of that money and use from other people. To get. Uh, the mobile units. I know we have talked about, uh, we got rid of just about all of my thinking, John Yates. How many schools now do we have with mobile units? Six. 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 So, Northern Shores is one of them. Okay, all right. That'll be well. Anyway, I, I think that uh, this is a good meeting. I think we need to really look at the numbers. <coughs> And then we come back together again and look at it and say, well, you know, this is the bottom line. This is what uh, the city has as a budget. This is what you all are requesting. So let's compromise. Let's come together. Or we said, okay, we can't spend more than we have coming in. So therefore, we all need to say to not be angry because I'm not getting what I'm asking for or what I need. But we're trying to do whatever we can. Because it's all about our children. That's what this money is used for. It's not for any purpose other than educating our children. And, and the way the world is now, if you, every time you pick the, see the news, uh, we need to actually continue to invest in our education. So, again, I thank you all for coming, and I'm looking forward to the next meeting. Vice Mayor Ward. Uh, <clears throat> before I uh, say a couple of things I want to say. I'm not good at that, but I want to thank Dr. Gordon and Dr. Buck and the principal at Creekside, Ms. Pulaski or Alaska Pulaska. I want to thank her. And you two know what I'm saying and what, what the situation was. If ever one ever been a person who handled a situation well, she handled it very well. And Dr. Buck know how I feel about children, and she know how I feel about my own. Okay? She handled it very well. Because I taught my daughters, they went to public school. They graduated from Nazareth River. So what I'm saying to you, Dr. Gordon, is that it was not only the parent, it was also the principal. And I thank your help. You know I thank your help. I'll call you in a minute. It's always hard for me to respond to something, some things that I say because the first thing people say is I talk with anger. But I don't talk with anger. I talk with caring. And I think you all get that mixed up. I can't sit here and not say what I feel. I just don't like to. Because the simple fact is, I want to ask the question is, it's not disrespecting nobody. It's December 5th. Why it took so long for us to meet? I got a problem with that. I got a problem with that. 
I got a problem with our CIP. We have done our CIP. We do, we have met and did everything that that the city asked and we had to do with our money, how far our money go without raising taxes. We did all this. Now, and I'm gonna say this because I know most of y'all don't want to say it all the time, but now here we go again with a joint meeting. And sometimes I feel, I ain't gonna talk about nobody else, Some I can take care of myself. I feel that people look at council like we don't want to work with the school board. Well, we don't want to help the children. And I'm not let y'all, I'm not gonna let y'all keep lying like nobody what well, assume to me. Because it hurt me when I hear this. And some of y'all just got on board. I've been here eleven years, almost twelve years. I've been three three elections. Mr. Bennett, Councilman Bennett been here longer. Okay. Mr. Dooman. And one of the ladies said that I like this meeting. I love this meeting. Like some people, I like this carry on. I want to see what's going on. That's right. Let's see what's going on. You know how long we've been talking about them trailers? You know how many people got elected from these trailers? Why are we playing this trailers? Dr. Buck took us around Northern Shores, and we did need that. And we got that. Yes, we did need it in Northern South. Them trailers have been there for a while. We were talking about the crowded part. Who gonna call the shot? I'm waiting for somebody to call the shot. Let's do it. I think just, I think we ready. But it goes back to when I feel, here we go. The council don't want to do this. Somehow we gotta cut that out and stop that. We can't just have a meeting before a new year. A matter of fact, and I'm gonna say this here. We got a we got a group that meet, or an educational group. If we don't want to meet together, joint, y'all can talk it over in there. I think we still have that group. Do we still have that group, Mayor? Educational group. Just want to know. Because I just don't like to kick hands and, and act like it can't be done. I didn't get elected to work for me. I got elected to work for me. the people put me in, and I take it very seriously. You might don't think so, but I do. When I have a school problem, you know what I tell the person? Let me call Dr. Buck. She's the educator. Let me talk to the mayor. He's in charge. Because I don't want to say nothing that I can't do or it's not right. I'm gonna stop, Mayor, because I know you get I get wind up, and I know I go past five minutes, but I just got to say how I feel. What took you so long? And then if you want us to, you don't know our CIP, <coughs> you don't want us to raise no taxes unless you want to give us authority to raise taxes. I mean, that's what I'm just saying. So if we're gonna make, if we're gonna talk about these trailers, let's get it done. This trailer, this been on for. <laughs> Eight years, we didn't talk about it. I only won twice. We didn't talk about trade. We went, we went to Northern River, Northern, Northern Shore. That's that's not nothing new for you to come on and say. Well, you know the trailers, uh, this, <laughs> this been here before when the new councilman came on. When are we gonna get this done? You got kids like you say. You got to, they got to go out. Thank you for this meeting. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I like to see more of y'all, but don't do it at the end of the year. Do it while CIP is in. I mean, I would like to see that for them. If you want some, we buy. Thank y'all for doing it. Y'all, it's great there sitting among y'all. Cause I know how hard teaching is. I know how hard it is for the school board. And I, and they said y'all are special, but y'all very special, cause y'all dealing with some of my kids. <laughs> And I consider all my kids because it's, you know it's, you know what make me feel so good when I go to go to one of them schools or go to one of them lunches, and they are so happy with so much energy, and just ask them what they want to do. There ain't, there ain't no, no negativity come out of them kids. I want to be the, one of the best school system around. Yes, I do. So I'm not gonna sit here and not support you. I don't think none of us will do that. 
But if we sit back and keep kicking it out down the can and make sure that somebody else make the decision, that's what's going on. That's the way I feel. That's just me, man. Thank you all again. And Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Buck, Dr. Gordon, thank you again for what you all did, and I really appreciate that. God bless you. Okay, I'm going to give Chairman Reddick a few minutes. He'd like to respond right to now. Vice Mayor's yeah. question. Vice Mayor Ward, you asked the question, what took us so long to get here? I want to dispel any misconception that the school board didn't want to come to the table. I myself requested twice via email and twice via in person, and I can give you the date March 16th at 12.56 um, p.m., March um, September the 12th at 3.28 p.m., and there were several other meetings, and if I can get back to my office, I can give you those dates as well. We requested joint meetings, and we requested them to be quarterly, as we all said in this room the last two times we've been here. But we can't force anyone to come to the table. So we are requesting, and it is, I believe, all of the board members hope that we meet together as often as possible. I keep hearing the reference of the Education Committee. The board has took its stand on the Education Committee, and that's the will of the board. But we are willing to meet in a joint meeting, but when we're requesting joint meetings, if that's not being allowed, we can't call it ourselves unless you all are willing to come to the table. But I did everything on behalf of the Suffolk City School Board, just as my predecessor has done, um, to come to the table. So I understand how you're speaking from Karen. I speak from that same place as well. And I believe we ha we're moving in the same direction and we want the same things. But we are trying to come to the table, but it's a two-way street. I want to say that. Let me, I have to say something, man. Forgive me. You said you are the chairperson. Am I right? Correct. Okay. When you took that job, you already knew what was going on. So you, in a way, you knew that what we had was not meeting. It, that was, should have been on your agenda to correct, make sure we do meet. But that's one of the, one, that's one of the downfalls. We didn't meet. But this time when we met, our CIP is already done. And then it looks like we can't help you right now on certain things. I mean, it's done. Why, why do it after we do the CIP? So to respond to that, you got the... I'm asking I'm, you. I'm, don't, don't put nobody else. I'm asking no, you. No, I'm not. Tell me you. I'm you. not. As I previously stated, Go ahead. on March 16th, prior to the CIP, at 12.56 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a meeting was requested. The request was denied from your end, we did our job. If you don't pick up the phone and I'm calling, oh, and that's just the metaphor, I can't force you to answer and come to the table. Let me say so, this to you. Yeah, no, let me, oh, no, I, I let, you, you, like I let talk. you talk. Let me say this to no, you. No, no, let me say this to you. Well, I was because answering your when question. I was, when I, no, I'm the, I'm the councilman in, 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 in uh, Northern Suffolk. I'm the councilman here. Correct. If I have a problem, if somebody have a problem, and I know we got to take care of this problem. I'm going to continue the person who got to make the move, let them know this is important for my people, and let's try to get this done. This is what's important as far as I'm concerned. If you seen it coming, you already knew that if we, we wasn't meeting enough, I think you should have handled that better than this last day. Oh, I don't understand. But See, that's why I don't, like, that's why I don't like to get in a situation like that. I'm let's done. Me and you have to on. discuss. We can touch that later on. Okay, moving right along, it's now 5.05. Um, We've been at this two hours and five minutes, thereabouts. I'm not real good in math. And thank you, Chairman Riddick, for bringing that up. Chairman Riddick did request a joint meeting, and it didn't happen. Having experienced several joint meetings in the past, without having some more discussion before that, without having issues brought to the respective bodies, it's hard to accomplish anything in two or three hours with 15 people sitting at a table trying to discuss alternatives that could be rather complex 
time consuming, involves staff, etc. The Education Committee, and since it brought up, I'll bring that up and then we'll get into some more. Uh, the Education Committee was established back in 1999. It wasn't anything new, by the by. Nobody refused to attend those meetings back when they were attended before. The Education Committee was amended to bring it more up to date. The original Education Committee said we got involved in educational matters. We don't get involved in educational matters. That needed to go away. It said the Chief of Staff was the Secretary. We don't have a Chief of Staff anymore. So this, the Education Committee wasn't created a year or so ago. It was created in 1999. It was amended so it could reflect more accurately what the goals of that committee should be. That committee, like any other entity that I know of, be it the Senate, the House, corporations, whatever, everybody has committees. Those committees don't have any power. They're there for research. They're there to relay information from the body to the committee on both sides and then relay that information back to the respective bodies. So when they get together in a group like this, there is already some type of consensus. You've already had the opportunity to discuss it. I've been here for two hours and six minutes and nothing personal, I like everybody, but other than the fact that I found out that we have, it, we have adequate capacity in our schools right now, based on the numbers that were here, I was very interested to see what the student generation rates actually were rather than depend on a study that was done in 2021 that we paid over $400,000 for, $429,000 for a study, but how accurate is it? <coughs> I mean, I know the point of contention is going to be, well, it's not accurate. We've had too much building. There must be students everywhere. To Councilman Bennett's point, as it was pointed out, we don't have students everywhere. We've got them somewhere, but not everywhere. So other than that, other than to... beat a dead horse, if you will. We know all about mobile units. We know about the conditions in the schools. We know about now student generation. I mean, that is a given. So the goal should be, the goal should be, and I pulled up, I printed an article from November 26 of 2021 when we had a meeting. After the facility study, and I'm going to read you a quote. It's my quote, so I'll read it. Mayor Mike Newman, while noting the limited resources to build new schools, like the option of adding extra capacity to Nansen River for about $15 million. Good figure. He said he liked the idea of hanging, having a long-term strategic plan to accomplish as much as we can, as soon as we can, with the resources that we have available. Nothing's changed. That's what I want to do. The elephant in the room in regards to the CIP is the two elementary schools. It's about dollars and cents. It's about how can we utilize our resources. And when I say our resources, it's not our resources. It's the citizens' tax dollars to put to work to accomplish as much as I can, we can, not me, we can for the school system to upgrade deteriorated buildings that are in need of maintenance, that have leaky roofs and nasty mobile units and all the things we want to talk about, which is no question they're there. The facility study in regards to the F FCI, 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 whatever it is, I mean, nothing's changed there. So what has to change is how, what else are we going to look at? I've watched quite a few school board meetings. I haven't heard anybody talk about any type of redistricting or consolidation. The only talk I got is we don't want it. Well, you don't want it in regards to two elementary schools is $107,880,993 to build two schools. You consolidate schools and you're going to save a minimum of $40 million, if not closer to 50. 
And I'm looking at these numbers, how they've increased over the years, and I'm not, I don't totally understand why they've increased as much as they have. I mean, some of these estimates have gone, I mean, I, I don't get it. It's gone from, Nazareth Parkway, went, you know, just for one, went from 30,600 to 56, 56 million. I looked at the inflation numbers for building over the last three years. This year is kind of leveled out. It's only 2.4% for the year. The year before that was 8.4%. The year before that was 18%. So 18% is a substantial number. But my point is we have to start looking, and the school board needs to consider options that will result in a much accelerated ability to accomplish what we want to accomplish to satisfy these problems. And that includes some type of redistrict and re consolidation, especially as far as the elementary schools are concerned. I can't believe that we got Nansman River pushed out so far. I, when, I, when this thing came out, I said, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. If I could write the check for $15 million, I'd do it right now. You can solve the entire high school capacity issue by putting a three or four hundred additional in Nansman River for at least the next decade. And you can't really redistrict there because all the growth's on the east side, so you'd have to pass Nansman River to get. So, I mean, these are just, can we do all that? I don't know. But my point is, this board, for whatever reason, does not have a will to consider other options that were in the facility study. I didn't make them up. They're in there. They're dollars and cents. Two plus two is four. Three plus three is six. It's always going to be. I would find a way somehow to make some of these things happen. But it's very frustrating when none of that is even being considered. And I've heard, well, there's three options in there. That's one of the options. One of the options is what we're doing. Well, I could be on the third floor of the building and have three options. I can take the steps. I can take an elevator. I can jump out the window. Mm -hmm. All of them going to get me on the bottom floor. That's true. So which one's the best way to go? Do we want to jump out the window because that's one of the options? Or do we want to look at how long it takes to get to the, chair, get to the stairs as the elevator broke or whatever? Those are the type of real discussions that we need to have. Coming in here and talking about the same thing all the time, nothing's changed from this one, the one before that, the one before that, the one before that. And I still cannot understand why there is not a willingness to take advantage of any time you have an opportunity to meet and work collaboratively with a body that is supposed to be working collaboratively. And that's in regards to the Education Committee. Not only do I consider it a slap in the face that we know we're not going to do that, and this fact that, well, you only have two people or three people, that's nobody speaking for the board. And certain members with that opinion were already on boards that were only two people on them or three people on them. So, Let's just be realistic about what we're talking about. If there's, I mean, it's, somebody can tell me if we've accomplished anything in the last two hours and now ten minutes, because I've used ten rather than no, it's only seven minutes, Roger. <laughs> With the time that I've used, what have we really accomplished? Other than to identify and talk about everything we've talked about and the fact that you'd like to have this and we only have that. That doesn't require a joint meeting, I mean, in my opinion. But if we could really have some productive meetings, if we could really get the, do the Education Committee, talk about those things in detail, bring that information back to respective boards, and try to come up with a consensus. I mean, it's just, I mean, I get all kinds of numbers on that, but I mean, we can, but I, but I was really, I mean, I'm glad we got to see these current numbers and the capacity issues. I mean, these aren't my numbers, but, you know, from an, from an elementary school standpoint, you know, there's 7321 in capacity and, and your current enrollment is 6906. It's 1415. There's 3620 capacity in, in middle schools and you're at 3204 and it's 316. High schools is 
5172 capacity and you're 4341. These are my numbers, they're numbers. So that should tell you something. As far as where the growth is, it's all in this study. It goes to each individual school. If you need to know what borough it is, just look and see what school the borough is in, you add them all together. And that's where it's going to be. Because those, those numbers are based on pipeline development, projected development, and all these other things that we got up here, live births, historical enrollment, census data, building permits, and 400 some thousand dollars worth of information. So I, I don't have any problem. We can have another joint meeting uh, when we can have these. I mean, if you want to have one every three months, we can have one every three months. But this was more of an informational meeting with that it was actually accomplishing anything. So anyhow, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and, no. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and have the uh, manager talk about whatever, and then we'll close it up in final remarks. Right. I would just do real quickly, if we could, uh, Kevin, if you could hit the uh, next slides here. Um, as you're aware, or I believe you're aware, that uh, the city uh, provided some funding to lease a new facility over on Bright Lane for the operations center, which I believe uh, Terry staff is moving out of here in the next month or so, if not already, into Bright Lane, and which has freed up uh, uh, the older facility, or will free up the older facility once they're all moved. And that, and plus some of the storage, I, I believe, a driver. With that uh, said, uh, we do have, of course, the Free Avenue uh, property is within is already within the city's name, uh, but <coughs> as we go forward and we move properties around, even as we look down the road, there are certain elements that have to be done. Uh, and so we just thought we'd just touch them real quickly here. And this is in state code section 22.1-129.A. Uh, the first bullet is school board may sell property and may retain all or portion of proceeds with approval of local governing body and after a public hearing. Uh, the second method the school board may convey title to real property to the city upon adoption of a resolution stating property is surplus and shall record resolution and deed to the property of the clerk of circuit court. Upon recording, um, the real property title shall be vested with the city. Those are the two options in the state code that the property would be uh, turned back to the city. And the reason I, uh, we bring this up is, is where we are uh, today and where we may be headed here in the near future. Just wanted to put it out there. It's not really, it's more of an advertisement than anything today, not unless we want to discuss it. I just wanted to point out what the state code was. Uh, we do have, again, uh, <clears throat> Terry's division, the operations division. It's uh, finally getting out of Freeney Avenue, which after I toured that facility, it's well understood why. Um, and then again, uh, Driver Elementary is currently used for storage and um, in some elements, obviously, the gymnasium is still used by the Nansmith River High School wrestling team. So should that property be turned over to say there would be special um, arrangements for that activity. Um, at this time, Dr. Gordon, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Mayor Doom. So, you know, <laughs> this meeting took a turn real quick. But um, I do have to clarify a couple of things because we always want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about the information. Uh, we've all talked about and highlighted the work of JFK. JFK, 74 million and some change. City appropriated 53 million. School system wrote a grant for 15 million. School system also gave up or uh, allowed to be transferred because we want to put kids first. 6.5 million from the HR building to come up with that 74. Okay. And that really showed our willingness at $21 million, 21.5, and the city's willingness to make that project happen. Uh, I love what Mr. Johnson said about campus schools. And we actually talked about that when we toured Forest Glen. Um, and one of the, the conversations that I've had with uh, Mr. Riddick, um, the mayor, as well as uh, Mr. Moore, we also want to do something about Kilby Shores. And with Remember, Forest Glen also had the highest facility conditions index. We are open to Kilby Shores and Forest Glen being on the same campus site. We believe that can fit. And that will also address some of the issues that Mr. Rector said about saving some of the money. Now, we can't save $60 million in one swoop. I mean, we just can't do that. It's easy 
to say to combine our schools. But when you combine Kilby Shores and Elephant's Fork, that's 1,100 students. No elementary school should be 1,100. And when we look at option A and option B and option C of combining schools, two out of those three options would be necessary to make that combined school happen. Not only is it combining the schools, but it's also redistricting and rezoning. So that's two things you have to do for that to happen. And that's not something that I think is beneficial to our current school communities. The main concern with, with our schools is not the capacity of the schools. That's only three of them. The main concern with our schools is the condition of the schools. That's why we're pushing for these projects to get done. And remember, when the facility study was done in, after 1920, Mac Ben wasn't on the radar. But Mac Ben is now on the radar there. As a part of us giving up some of the funds or, or being OK with the transfer after the city manager and I, you know, we talk all the time, that $6.5 for the HR building that was to go for JFK still leaves the central office, which was supposed to move over there, into in the current professional building where the lease is 500K some per year for a building that when it rains in my office, you can hear it going down the wall. Mm -hmm. You can hear it. Plus, the HVAC equipment is out of date and just can't be repaired. So literally, the gentleman goes onto the roof with a hammer <coughs> and bangs it out so we can get some air conditioning and heating going on. And I want to thank Mr. Moore and his staff, Jerry, everybody that toured the central office to see how we had four people in the office that was built for one. So when you see the operations center on the CIP from the school board, one of the things that the staff has talked about is phase two of the operations center, based on what Mr. Moore just described with Bright Lane, should become the new SAO. Mm -hmm. We could literally knock two birds out with one stone there, get out of the lease of the professional building, and then allow a central office to move into the phase two that is no longer required from Mr. Napier. The last thing is about the joint meetings, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for confirming that Mr. Riddick had requested those. And the city manager and I had talked about it, and Vice Mayor Ward was right on the timing of it, because last year when we had the joint meetings, we actually did it in January which was one month before the Planning Commission made their final recommendations to the city, and that wasn't enough time. So it would be nice if the joint meetings ideally would take place in April and October. April would be one month before the city would appropriate money for the school operating budget, and then October to align when the, when the school system puts their CIP forward. Those things, I think, would, would potentially make sense to allow us to have some of the action that Mayor Duman is talking about because when it literally comes to renovating schools, it's not just adding capacity on, right? This also means you have to adjust the cafeteria, you have to adjust the gymnasium, and we have to do all this while kids are still in school. Part of the reason why we had to be very creative with the JFK project is because originally we wanted to have mega mobile units so that we could build it in a site, you know, right there. But those mega mobile units were going to cost us three to four million dollars each. Those are things that we couldn't do, which would have added 12 to $16 million to the project if we would have done one for each grade and then one for office, library, and cafeteria. We couldn't afford that. The main concern with Elephant's Fork Elementary School, we are lucky that we're <coughs> grandfathered in. Today's code does not allow buses and cars to come through the same entrance. That's the reason why we have the backup at Elephant's Fork Elementary School, because we have two forms of traffic coming in and out of that school. No school project can move forward with that. And Kilby Shores being on the corner, uh, Mr. Johnson is exactly right. We get concerns about that all the time, all the time, which is part of the reason why we're recommending this campus style with Kilby Shores and Forest Glen, because you have two separate tiers that will not in impact buses or cars or anyone else. Remember, if we're serious about moving these projects forward with at least having approximately 200 seat capacity, which will allow us to have to 10 to 20 more years before we had to take a look at things. That's what would need to happen. If we were going to combine schools, you would be at capacity within one year. One year, which isn't a good fiscal decision for it. So putting those schools on the same campus will save you 10 to $15 million automatically. And then we need to find out some other ways, because we're going to continue to write grants. And, and thank you as, for when Mr. Bennett mentioned that. The grant writers is everybody. Mm -hmm. It's Ms. Forsman, it's Ms. Connor, it's myself, it's Mr. Napier, it's Dr. Branch. Everybody takes a look 
edit because we don't have a grant writer on staff. And we put grants in for the Northern Shores expansion to include some of the upgrades to some equipment. And anytime you do a grant, the grant is only going to be for 20% of the project if they decide to give you 20% of the project. And hopefully we'll hear something back um, from that in the state within the next uh, 30 to 60 days. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that this meeting allowed everyone to understand the difference between the enrollment or capacity of a school and how the school is actually being used. Does not include pre-K, does not include mobile units, does not include the, the size of a special education mm -hmm. classroom, does not include cafeteria or hallways. Because remember, if kids are at lunch, then there's no one in the classroom. But you can't take another class and put it in there while they're at lunch. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that part separate. So you know, I definitely want to thank RRMM for being here. I want to thank Mr. Moore uh, for continuing to be very creative when it comes to our requests. You know, I'll do my budget presentation to the board in two months. In two months. And we have some challenges that we're going to look at, especially with the LCI for the city changing, as well as the word that all of us are hearing, and I'm sure Charles will agree with me, the money coming from the state is going to be tight, is what we've all been told. And with grant funds now being expired, we have to make some tough decisions on what is going to used to be paid for by grants is now going to be a part of the operating budget before we even talk about raises for our staff. So tune in that last Thursday of the month, and I'll make sure, as I always do, I give the, the uh, city manager, Mr. Moore, at least a week or two heads up of what I'm um, presenting based on the feedback that we receive from our school community, the board, and our staff in order to make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Warden. Okay, I um, guess that will wrap up. conclude our meeting. Um, Mr. Moore, I think it would be uh, appropriate if we go ahead and try to work on scheduling another joint meeting in March. Uh, or April. 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 Probably March April would be better. Months. And of course, we did want to have this meeting in November, the one we're having tonight, but it didn't meet the schedule that we proposed in November meeting. Yeah, so. It takes a little um, while to come up with it. If, if we could, uh, how about let's not do this on a council night. Let's do this on a day that is, it is a different day. If you can be here, fine. If you can't, try to do this. When we're going to council in about 29 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. So we gotta we got to come up with a better plan to do this at a different time. Okay, we can. We can find a different night than a standing council meeting. Yeah. And I think based on conversation we have with the city attorney there's some additional preparation to have a special meeting if we were to do so so for a special meeting you do have to have an agenda ahead of time so that you're speaking to that agenda because you because according to our city code you can only speak to what's on the special meeting agenda okay. so we just have to determine the agenda specific agenda and then get it out um, 30 days wait, two weeks. same thing it's uh, it's on the so for special meetings your advertising is less, but at the time that you advertise the meeting, you need to have the agenda set. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's attendance this evening, and um, hopefully we've garnered a little bit of information. We're all a little wiser as we uh, prepare to leave. Y'all be safe, and we don't we don't talk to you in the month. Everybody have a very joyous holiday season and a happy and prosperous new year. We're adjourned and we will reconvene at 6 o'clock.